From the center of the universe, Toronto, Ontario, Canada, this is the SDM Show with your host, Rob Cairns. The SDM Show focuses on business, life, productivity, digital marketing, WordPress, and more. Sit back, relax, grab your favorite drink, and enjoy the show. Here is Rob. Hey, everybody, Rob Cairns here. I'm the founder, CEO, and chief creator of amazing ideas at stunning digital marketing. In today's podcast, I take a walk down technical memory lane with my good friend Mark Westgard at WS Forms. Sit back, relax, grab a drink, and enjoy the show. This podcast is sponsored by Stunning Digital Marketing, the agency that can help protect your WordPress website today. Go to stunningdigitalmarketing.com and see what we can do to help you protect your business investment. That's stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Hey, everybody, Rob Cairns here. And today I'm here with my good friend, Mr. Mark Westgard at WS Forms. How are you, Mark? Doing good, Rob. Thanks for having me. Always a pleasure. We could go on for hours. We we should have, <laughs> as you said, just recorded the 15-minute conversation <laughs> for the show and really sad, and then we would have been done, right? So, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let's not do that again. <laughs> yeah, so and today we're not even going to talk about forms. We, we're no. actually going to talk about something a little bit fun, I think. And you and I were involved in a conversation I don't remember if was it on Twitter or Slack. I can't remember where it happened at this point. But the word BBS came up and we started mm. you and I going down memory lane. It doesn't that bring back memories for you? It brings back a lot of memories, yeah. A lot of memories. Yeah. We um it was funny. I was I think I was telling you, and I'll kind of start it with this for the listener. I started in telecoms when I was like 15. Um, I'm now 57. The first modem I ever had was a 300 baud uh, haze compatible that I threw into an Apple II Plus. By the way, I still have that machine today as a memory. So uh, kind of kicked <laughs> around. And I started dialing all these crazy bulletin boards. And then I got into stuff like Delphi and CompuServe and realized I didn't want to go there. They were just kind of expensive to say the least and it wasn't the membership charges it was actually the um roaming charges to get to one of their roaming numbers um how did you kind of start with telecoms well this is going down memory lane and i can't remember the exact sequence of events but my my dad used to work for a telecoms company he, he was a telecoms engineer and he worked for a power company called seaboard southeastern and Southeastern Electricity Board in in uh, Southeastern England, and he used to take me to work now and then, and I would dumpster dive and <laughs> find all manner of electrical oh. pieces, and um, ended up dragging home some kind of computer into my bedroom and oh. um, started pulling that apart and applying nine volt batteries to it to get it to work. And uh, eventually, my dad taught me about modems. And I, too, had a huge metal box that was a 300 baud modem, um, probably about the size of 10 iPhones stacked on top of each other, <laughs> which goes to show you how far technology's come. And um, and yeah, I, and then I would, I guess, eventually, I had like a 1200 baud and a 2400 baud. And, and in case people don't know what we're talking about, that's basically the speed of this device to yep. be able to send data across the network. So a 300 baud modem, to put it into perspective, was able to transmit 30 characters per second. So there was a, a start bit, eight data bits, and a stop bit at the end, and you could send 10 characters a second. So that yep. could barely keep up with you typing. And um, yeah, eventually would have the same problem as you. Now, now I was a bit younger, 
And for me to get permission to use the phone was, you know, that was that was a big deal. I think it was like probably 10, 20 pence a minute, which would soon add up when you're downloading whatever at <laughs> 240 characters a second. Yep. And um, yeah, and then my I lived in Scotland. So I was on the east coast of Scotland in a little village. And my best friend lived up the road from me about 25 minutes away. So in order for us to play multiplayer games, we would have to connect our two modems together. Um, and much to our um, parents' dis, dis, uh, dislike, because we would be running their phone bill up playing these two-player games. So, yeah. um, but, so the way it worked in the UK is that if you called a BBS, and it may, this may have been the same in the US, I guess, um, but if you if you called a BBS, if it was within, I think it was within 35 miles, that was classed as a local call or something. Yep. yep. Um, but if you went beyond that, it was an international call and the cost was through the roof. So mm-hmm. I used to write software for the Atari ST back in the day and um, used to read a magazine called ST Format and they had a cover disc on there. And I wrote some software for that called the BBS directory. And you would type in your local area number and mm-hmm. it would then scour a database of all the BBSs that I could find and would find all the ones that were local to you. So you could then use those BBSs using a local phone number. Thus, uh, reduce your phone bill. <laughs> so yeah. It was a lot more difficult back then. Nowadays, we just type a web, web address in and off we go. But back then, it was there was a lot to consider. <laughs> So so true. I, it's funny. You talk about the directory. And in Toronto, we had a a free computer rag called Toronto Computes, which was a newspaper. And the, the biggest thing that everybody wanted us for was the three or four pages in the middle that was did all the local BBS phone numbers. That <laughs> and then some guy got smart and he um, he created what was called FidoNet which was right. really interesting. Yep. FidoNet was, for those who don't know, was basically a system that allowed you to transmit messages for free to other BBSs not in your area. I was actually the uh, mail mover, what they called an NEC or Network Echo Mail Coordinator for Toronto for about three years. So <laughs> I used to understand the workings of that mess way too much. And it was quite, uh, it's quite interesting. And now we just send an email and we don't even think about it. Right. Yeah, I used to run a BBS and uh, not for very long, though, because my mother was upset mm. that the phone kept ringing. Yeah. <laughs> I was literally just connected to her phone line and she couldn't receive any incoming calls because I was always blocking the phone line. So, um, but it, it was fun times, you know, that, that was back in the day when computers were a lot more simple to use. Yeah, so um, it, was, it was funny. I went into my first year of college in 1985, and my father looked at me and said, I'm going to kill you because that phone's always busy. You know that problem, mm-hmm. right? And he said, you need to get your own phone line and pay for it <laughs> with a part-time job. And in those days, I think a phone line with no features was like 25 bucks. But the problem was in Canada – most phone lines were only why houses were wired for two lines. So in those days, wires were what we call twisted pair, right? Yep. And each set of wires had the capacity of running one phone line. Mm-hmm. And when they built new houses, and the house I'm in now is the original house, um, they only wired them for one set, one twisted pair of wire. Mm-hmm. We actually had to bring the phone company in to dig (laughs) and at that time that was all before deregulation so they had to do it at their expense now they would tell you to suck it up and find an ip solution and be done with you and they had to dig and put in another set of wires because i needed to get off my parents phone system (laughs) or i was gonna die (laughs) you needed that that connection yeah i remember when i had my first internet agency and we we were at our third office. We were growing quite fast just because it was, you know, the dot-com boom. Yep. We went from three people to 40 people pretty quickly. And we um, we had a, a couple of barns in the middle of a field that we converted into offices. 
oh no <laughs> and we had to yeah and that we didn't really think about it we we got there and then we thought hang on a minute we have no telecoms out here in the middle of a field surrounded by cows of course so <laughs> the only thing that we could get there was isdn lines um well, and i think i think we had two two bonded isdn lines to get us any kind of reasonable speed yeah. um but again you know back then file sizes were smaller images weren't as detailed as they are now so we were able to transfer data a, a lot a lot easier back then yeah my um it's funny because i want to carry the story a little more when i went to college uh a lot of universities and colleges were on the old bitnet network which mm -hmm. was a network that colleges and universities used to communicate and we had great access until some wonderful student decided to send a bomb threat to Jerusalem. <laughs> and that's like one of the worst places in the world. So that became goodbye student access to BitNet, goodbye communications to the world. Except <laughs> one thing. I was working part-time for the college in a computer lab. So the perks of that was I also had a staff ID. <laughs> <laughs> and I, yeah. I kept that job just so I could communicate with the world. <laughs> yeah, I think in the UK, our system was called JANET, Joint Academic Network. Yeah. Uh, and that's what all the colleges and universities were connected with. And I remember using that when I first went to university. I, I, kind of, I, I used to be into electronics because my dad was, and I diverged into computing um i was always a bit of a computing nerd there was a kid i was coding from the age of kind of eight me too um and um when i went to university i, I started an electronics course and thought hang on a minute i actually don't like electronics i prefer computers so i jumped That's onto right. onto a computer degree mm -hmm. um but yeah yeah back then it was all janet and there was kind of no the internet was was still being born, really. And, you know, it, the internet technologies have been around for years. All the RFCs on it have been around for years, but it, it was still growing back then. Um, but yeah, nowadays my kids just don't even think about it. The internet for them is just it's just there. <laughs> so yeah. I think they realize how much work's gone into to building that that system. It's true. And you were talking about ISDN lines when I worked at Women's College. So when I got into healthcare, I had worked oh, professionally as a programmer for four years and realized I'm bored and I yep. needed to get into uh, support. So I spent time in support and we put the internet in and we were running two dual ISDN lines. Mm -hmm. at that time. They're not anymore, needless to say, but <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> no, it's, it's quite interesting. And what's kind of driven this is file sizes, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, people complain about file sizes. And I was thinking, I was talking to my mom about this the other day. Uh, hi, mom. And uh, and there was, um, we were talking about when she got her first digital camera. Mm -hmm. I remember going out and getting a 512 meg. So listen, meg, not gig, <laughs> a flash card for, for a Christmas gift. And what that cost at that time. Mm -hmm. Now we're all carrying data around in our pockets that uh, my smartphone's got 128 gigabytes on it and shoots way better pictures, right? Isn't that interesting how that's progressed a little bit? Yeah, and what interests me is when I think the first digital camera I bought was a uh, Fuji. Okay. It was, it was almost like a, it was like an old box camera. Yeah, um, yeah. I have know? Yep. And, and when I used to take photos with that, I used to be like, wow, these pictures look amazing. And now if I go back through my old photos and look back at them, I think, oh, these are terrible quality. <laughs> well, um, but, you know, I had um, I had an Olympus at one time, mm -hmm. and it was a, a six megapixel camera. And I, I'll yep. bet you my smartphone, the Pixel probably is like 30 megapixels to give you some idea. To yeah. So the... For those listening, pixels means the more pixels, the higher quality the photo, right? And yeah, and the and the thing was, um, with this Olympus, which was really cool, was I have some uh shots I took in Niagara Falls that look like they were on postcards. It, yeah, I mean, it's not just the megapixels with cameras, it's also the ability to shoot, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and nowadays, I feel like we've got more memory than we need, you know, and, and no, almost no, to... no. <laughs> well, maybe not you, Rob. <laughs> I'm, I'm, a bit of a, I'm a bit of a data whore. Um, I'm looking <laughs> at beside me. You can't see it. 
believe it or not, a 16 terabyte USB 3 hard drive. <laughs> Isn't that unreal? What have you got in there, Rob? Uh, what? <laughs> Lots um, of client work, I'm sure. Yeah, when I started at, um, to give you an idea, what, so when I started at Women's College with memory, we were buying hard drives that were 420 megabytes. And now we're buying gigabyte. Like, it's yeah. stupid what we're buying, terabyte hard drives. It's yeah. Just... Oh, yeah, yeah. It's uh, And also, the thing is, though, with, with the web uh, in, in the U.S., we're spoiled most of the time with how much bandwidth we've got but we still need to consider you know other places in the world that don't have that bandwidth particularly on mobile um yep. i've learned a lot of that by dealing with customers and um you know them telling me hey you know this is loading quite slow on a mobile device and i'm like well i try it on mine it's working fine and then you have to re realize we're on a 5g network that can handle you know ridiculous amounts of bandwidth now Yep. Um, compared to some areas. And, and also, if I go and visit my family in Scotland, they live in rural areas and they just do not have the bandwidth that we have. Yep. And um, so there are still you know, limitations out there. Nothing like we used to have, obviously, with modems, but um, they're still there. Still, still got to consider it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, you know, we're getting to the point where, you know, coffee shops have internet, hotels have internet. By the mm -hmm. way, which I never use unless I'm watching movies because I don't like the security aspect of that. So yeah, yeah, never put your real name or email address in. <laughs> no, I have a uh, I have a 200 uh, gigabyte data plan a month, so I just yeah. there to the phone and away I go. That's it. Um, while we're talking about tech, and one of the things you and I got into, which was really fun, is we started talking about old video games. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. I think I shared with you, um, most of my viewers don't know, I'm a classic video game collector. So mm -hmm. I've got, uh, I have an old ColecoVision. Believe it or not, the original place that Mario showed up, people forget Mario showed up in Donkey Kong before he ever showed up on yeah. <laughs> I have an original Nintendo just to play Mario. Yeah, I've got an original Atari uh, 2600 the, mm. uh, video. That's with the, wood that, with wood paneling. Yeah, with wood paneling. <laughs> now I don't play the Atari because I bought Atari re-released all their video games on one machine, mm -hmm. fifty bucks. So I have one of those, just so I can um, shoot Space Invaders. There you go. Bring back some nostalgia. And I think I was telling you, I have an original Space Invaders console game where I've had the cabinet redone yep. back to the period of 1979, and all the electronics in it are modern. And it's at my other house house in the basement right now. So <laughs> there you go. Like, there's a little bit of nostalgia. And you've got something special, don't you? Yeah. I mean, I've, I've got uh, – I don't have a huge collection of stuff, but I've tried to um, – bring my childhood back to life in my house. So I've, I've got an old Atari ST that's been renovated. Um, but I think my, my favorite toy is I've got a, uh, a twin cab Daytona USA arcade machine from 1994, which has all the original electronics in it. So it's actually got Sega risk processors in it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and um, there are, it's quite interesting the way it's, it's made. It has, uh, these circuit boards in it that are stacked four or five tall, and mm -hmm. each one of the balls does a different bit of the game. So Daytona USA is a racing game. Uh, yep. I used to I used to put so much money in this arcade machine. You on, might as well buy it. <laughs> on Brighton Beach, uh, that I I thought I've got to get one of these so I can get my money back. <laughs> and I found a guy in North Atlanta uh, yes. in the US that. That, uh, that had one sitting in his, his workshop that his grandchildren used to come and play at the weekends. And he wanted to get rid of it. And I went up there and saw it and he switched it on and it all worked. And I thought, oh, I've got to have this. And he sold it for a great price. Mm. And I got a couple of guys in a truck to bring it back. And by the time it had come, came, it got back in my house, the screens didn't work. <laughs> <laughs> Things started breaking on it. Um, and there's one guy in the US that still has the schematics for this machine. He's, a, he's an ex Sega worker and he was able to repair some of the stuff. And then we had to put new screens in it. Uh, I say new screens, I didn't want to put flat screens in it. Um, yeah. I wanted to put original CRT cathode ray tube screens in it. 
And there's another guy in Atlanta, on the west side of Atlanta, who has a warehouse just full of CRT screens. That's all he does. He's just got this warehouse full of CRT screens. They all weigh a ton. And the funny thing is, all the screens have the game that was played on them burnt into them. So he brings one down and he turns it on. And then we look at it to see, you know, oh, this one's Donkey Kong. No, I don't want that one. (laughs) And then we'll find another one. And it's got a different game. But, oh, that one's Street Fighter. No, we don't want that one. And you have to try and find one that doesn't have a game burnt into it. Um, But managed to, yeah, get it renovated. And um, it was really fun actually getting the kids to play the game because they are so used to all these modern games, you know, with Playstations and Xbox Mm -hmm. and stuff like that. But when they got onto this game, which is, it's still a very simple game with relatively simple graphics, but it was one of the first ever 3D games, racing games that came out. Um, And um, they love it. They just love the gameplay and they they love playing it because it's so simple. And I think that's the great thing about games is you can go back to that Atari 2600, play the most simple game and spend hours on it, just as you would a game now that costs millions to be produced. And, um, you know, it, it, it takes, uh, it, yeah, it, you can just, you can play the simplest games with, with your family and, and not need all that, that fancy stuff nowadays. No, I, I so appreciate like older games because as you know, I'm a sports fanatic and yep. EA Sports makes most of the sports games. Yep. A lot of them are made in Vancouver, Canada. They bought a design house a number of years ago mm-hmm. and these new games, they drive me insane. Because the AI is too complicated. All I want to do is pick up my controller, shoot. And, you know, I was playing uh, the other day, I was playing classic Doom on Windows. Oh, Oh, yeah. Yeah. There's another one. First person shooter, nothing to it. All I wanted to do is pick up and kill something. Yeah. You know that that Doom game? I used to play that a lot at university. There's actually a JavaScript version of Doom online that enables you to play multiplayer. (laughs) So if you ever fancy a game, just let me know. We'll have to go online. Yeah, we can do that. (laughs) Um, And then I was thinking, I also have a selection. Shh. I don't know if I should talk about this, but I won't. There's an <laughs> emulator out there called MAME, and yeah. most classic game players have heard it. So what they've basically done is gone and cracked the old game ROMs, which is mm-hmm. the software, and loaded in there. And I was playing some of that, and I'm like, I remember these, and it was just, yeah. it was just quite fun. Like because I'm okay with shooting stuff. I'm not okay with. Oh, I have to move this controller here to make this move here, and that you know that. Yeah, that's, well, a lot of these old, you know, these the Atari STs, the Spectrums that we used to have, they were mainly developed for the game market. And yes, you could do a bit of desktop publishing on the Atari or the Amiga yep. or whatever, or you know, music. Uh, I used to write MIDI software for the Atari, um, but ultimately they were bought for for gaming. And, yeah. yeah. Um, it's funny just playing some of the old games and realizing how bad some of those games actually were, but you seem to remember spending a few weekends playing them. So um, what, what I would say to anybody is if you're into classic games, you can check out MAME or the other Dirty Little Secret is go to somewhere like Alibaba and they've got all kinds of game machines that have old games on them and buy yeah. them and save the aggravation. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's fun looking at some of the old stuff, you know. Yeah, it is. Uh, like the old Nintendo sixty four with Golden Eye was a classic, but um, yeah, you can get some great old, you know, classics from eBay. Uh, you'll find people going through the attic and finding a, a boxed mm-hmm. game system, and if you snap mm-hmm. it up for one hundred and fifty bucks, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah, um, yeah. I wish I, I wish I had more. There's a there's a few more full-size arcade machines that I'd like to get. I would, eventually, I would love to get another double-stack, uh, you know, dual-stack Daytona because you can actually connect eight of them together. Yeah, they were yeah. one of the first games that were connected together with fiber optic, funny enough. Um, but, yeah, it'd be fun to extend that. But I just don't have the room for it. This thing weighs a ton, and it's it's like a, an elephant in the room. <laughs> so, so I have my eye on a wood pinball machine. Oh yeah, not an electronic one. I want a wood one. Yeah, because what wood ones do is you can 
tilt them a little bit. And <laughs> it's all about how I can make the ball go here and not kill my ball. You know what I mean? Oh, now I know your tactics, Rob. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I too have spent many a quarter in an arcade in my lifetime. Like yeah, really yeah. Many, way to it. Yeah, yeah. I, I um I used to live on well, I I, I used to live close to Brighton. Uh, on the coast and i would jump on the train go down to the coast and play in the arcades much to my dad's horror um but um yeah there's there's a lot of old old games from the past that i'd I'd love to be able to play again it's funny if i I go into an arcade nowadays i'm i am still looking around just to see if they've got one in the corner somewhere but most of it's modern stuff now that spits out a a token or a ticket to uh to exchange for some terrible one penny prize <laughs> crap that we don't need. Yeah. 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 It? yeah it, it's so, it's so true. Um, you wrote an article that showed up in a computer mag at one time, I think. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Several. Um, that was, that was, it started when I was quite young. I think the first piece of software I wrote, I was, I want to say I was 16. Um, so I wrote some cover disk software, and then I would just write stuff, particularly around the internet industry. When I when I first started my agency, yeah. um, and internet magazines had just come out, then they were hungry for articles about you know website development and what you've done. Uh, I remember doing one for a photo company um, that sold cameras and stuff, and we did a whole like four page spread in there about that. So yeah, it was quite quite active back in the day in the old magazine industry. Um, nowadays, most of it's online, blogs and, and things like this. But yeah, yeah, back back in the day, it was magazines, and you, you'd have to wait a month for the next edition to come out. <laughs> it was funny because I I can remember being an Apple guy. Um, mm-hmm. Apple had a big uh, fan magazine called Nibble back in the day. You might mm-hmm. have remembered it. And the big advantage of Nibble was there was all kinds of programs in there. And you had to take the code and put the code in. And then when you got a thousand lines in there, it was like, freak me. Where's my error? <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get these stupid programs to run. Right? I think somewhere in this office. Let me have a quick look. That's okay. Oh, yeah. Hang on. Yeah. <sighs> Now, I don't know if people will just be listening to this or looking at it, but oh. this is a, a book I found on eBay. Oh, the yeah. Spectrum Book of Games. Oh, that's and so cool. You would spend many, many an hour typing out games line by line. Um, and you'd end up with a game, you know, with a line and a, and a square on the screen. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> uh, but I quite like how the, um, the, the, Images they've got in the book showing what the game looks like. The shape of the screen is an old CRT shape. It's no longer square. It's not square like it is nowadays. So, yeah. but uh, yeah, good. many many an hour typing these in. Some of these you would probably spend an afternoon typing this in and then debugging it because you got one line wrong somewhere. Five days <laughs> later. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, let's move on to TVs. Just an interesting one. You know, I was sharing a story the other day with a good friend. And I said, I'm a baseball fan and baseball is notoriously slow. Problem number one. So I can remember going to college and watching world series games while I was doing homework, bad Rob. I know. <laughs> but I was a student, had to get to work done on a seven inch black and white TV because yeah. <laughs> my parents got fed up. And went to one of the big box stores, one in Canada called Consumers Distributing, and said, here, because you can get that crap off the um, aerial, and you don't need cable, because cable was in its infancy, right? And uh, you can watch TV up here and leave our big TV alone. And at that time, <laughs> it was like a 29-inch CRT TV. Do you remember those? Oh, right? yeah. And that was expensive to buy back then. Yeah, and now behind me, I have a forty-three inch TV, which is lighter than a feather, and you know, probably a hundred bucks. Uh, <laughs> it's ridiculous. And I got this one; it was closer to three, but yeah, same yeah. like. Oh yeah, it's it's crazy where where it's come. I used to have a small, I don't know how big it was, probably a fifteen inch screen, and it had a problem with the so you know. 
a CRT screen for the for the newer generation um, would basically be a big gas filled glass uh, yeah. screen with three guns in it that would fire um, at the the phosphor on the front of the screen, and you'd have a red one, a green one, and a blue one. And there was something wrong with my screen, where I think the green one was always more powerful than the the other two. So every every picture I had was was bright green. So being the kid I was, I dismantled the TV, pulled the back off it, and I would adjust the the guns inside it, and often give myself an electric shot. Not advised. Um, but yeah, now nowadays it's a lot simpler, isn't it? You can you can go to an electronic store and walk out with a screen for 150 bucks. That's you know, back in the day, would have cost an absolute fortune. I mean, I'm working at an HP 32-inch uh, uh, flat screen in front of me as we yeah. speak. So, yeah. and and I remember because when I started in support, we were still buying CRTs. Uh, mm -hmm. flat screens were just starting to come in, and uh, the the hardest thing I hated more than anything was a user calling and saying, my monitor's dead. And I'd have to lug one of these things <laughs> and turn around because they were heavy. They were and, heavy. Yeah. I I, um, I have a funny story about screens. I When I was, again, running my first internet agency, uh, so this was around 2000. So we we're going through the millennium. And I was working with the Millennium Dome in London. And Millennium Dome was this huge building. You've probably seen it, big white tent with big yellow uh things coming out the top of it holding it up uh, in in london on the east side of london and they built this to do a big show for the millennium and it ran for about a year and um they had these um plasma screens in there which mm -hmm. were huge i mean these things were i mean huge for back then they were probably like 48 inch plasma screens which cost an absolute fortune yep and we were approached by the Millennium Dome to auction off all the contents of the dome. So everything from oh, the seating to wow. the shows to the exhibits. Uh, I mean, we, we, there was like a giant baby that was about, I don't know, 80 foot tall that we had to get rid of. So we wrote the website to do that auction. And it was supposed to be a B2B business to business experience. Mm -hmm. And um, about two or three days before this went live, the Sun newspaper in the UK, big, big uh, rag in the UK. Known got, for known for uh, scantily uh, quotes yes. on the front page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They were the famous page three uh, newspaper back then. Who the Toronto Sun modeled their page three. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, glad look, they've moved on from that, I think. Oh, not too much, but, yeah, still still the Sun. But uh, they, they got wind of it. And then published in their newspaper the web address for this auction <laughs> that we put on there. And they mentioned, hey, they've got about, I don't know, 100, 200 of these plasma screens going cheap, <laughs> which uh, absolutely crashed our server the day that it went live. So the whole oh, thing was an absolute disaster. <laughs> so we were expecting, you know, two, 300 people to go on it. But no, we had almost the entire UK trying to log on and get one of these 48-inch plasma screens. Right, but, that's uh, yeah. Yeah, that's that's funny. And and even things like radio has changed. Like I said to somebody the other day, I was listening to a ball game and I was trying to get some work done. What, what else is new? And they said, how are you listening to that ball game? You don't own a radio. And I said, radio via the Internet. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, I actually have, believe it or not, I have a transistor radio for emergencies. Yeah, me too. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a good idea. Um, we all know that in Canada, in the U.S., AM radio is subsidized by the government for bandwidth for emergencies, right? Yeah. We, do, we do know that. Um, I have two, and I can actually say the name in this room, so I'm, I'm sorry if you have one in your room. I have an Alexa in the corner, but the wake word's not Alexa, so <laughs> <laughs> I wonder yeah. why. And then I've got a couple of computers in front of me, and it's like... I don't need a, a conventional radio. I mean. No, no. All comes through the internet. It's amazing how reliant we are on the internet nowadays, and we don't even think about it. It's all all second nature. Yep. Uh, it's all, and, all running behind the scenes. But it, it's funny. There's um, an internet technology out there called WiMAX. You've probably heard of it. Hmm, I haven't, no. WiMAX is a series of antennas that are basically repeaters. Okay. And where WiMAX was planned to be used was in the rural. 
That's mm-hmm. what was designed for it. You know, or why Max is showing up in the country, in this city. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's incredible how much data we can send across the air nowadays. I was in Boston, I think it was, <laughs> and um, I was sat next to one of their 5G towers. And I thought, oh, I'm just, just going to see what type of bandwidth I can get out of this thing. Oh, my God. And it, it was pulling down. I'm trying to think what it was now. It was just, it was absolutely insane. I think it was two gig down on a cell phone and I, was, I just couldn't believe it um the other day i was about to have a conference call with a client and i had a power cut and so i thought well i'll go to starbucks and do the conference call from there and i sat in the car and i thought well i'll just try connecting through my uh through my phone yeah and i got better bandwidth from my phone than i did from my home internet connection i know <laughs> it, it, it's, it's crazy. crazy crazy i mean i run i think i was sharing with you before we went to record i have a phone with a 200 gigabyte gigabyte data plan <laughs> and you only have 100 gigs and if you remember last christmas we had covid go through our house and i ended yeah. up up in niagara falls on my own for a couple of days yeah. to avoid the whole mess by the way i still haven't gotten it everybody around me has oh, well. <laughs> and um what i did was i upped my data plan uh, because we had a major ice storm coming in okay. and I knew the minute the ice storm came in um some of the internet repeaters in the hotels were going to go down and mm. i I had work to do, so I yeah. uh, and I've just left it. I I commute a lot. I'm a I'm a commuter, and um, so I take regional buses and stuff, and they all have Wi-Fi on them. And frankly, I never use it for security yeah. reasons. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, I know what you mean. If I'm in, if I'm ever in a an airport connecting to their internet, I still don't put my right name or email address in. Yeah. <laughs> I try, try to keep it private. Yeah. But, but uh, going back to this whole thing about how much the internet drives, I don't know if you know, but we had a major rail outage in the greater Toronto area two days ago. Okay. And CN, which is the Kane National Railway, mm-hmm. Railway yeah. which impacted all our commuter trains because they use CN tracks. And do you know what caused it? They had an internet outage. At a repeat. There you go. And they did a software upgrade that went bad. And uh, goodbye. And we yeah. were without train service for five hours. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing the impact when something with the internet goes wrong. You know, if if a, if a provider has like a DNS issue or something like that. Yeah. Or, you know, Cloudflare now and then have issues as well. And, and then you realize, hang on a minute, I've got all my eggs in one basket. <laughs> I should have split this up a little bit. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's um, it's a big Achilles heel in some places. But, yeah, uh, you know, it, it is what it is. This has been like so much fun. I I love reminiscing with you because this we could go on for hours. We could go on for hours. <laughs> I have to ask you: Was there one person, figure, media that was a big impact into your love of technology? My dad, I think. Yeah, he was always tinkering with electronics or with a computer. He was, you know, he he was the the guy that brought the computer into the home and started mm-hmm. hitting buttons. And I think it probably was a, oh, I'm trying to think now. Probably, I mean, we did have the game systems like you did, but then I think he brought back a Commodore 64, was it? Something like that. Yeah. Um, and then a Spectrum, and then it just kind of grew from there. So he would he would spend hours and hours tinkering away and coding, much to my mother's... Um, Chagrin. Yeah, she. Yeah, I think that caused the divorce. <laughs> But uh, yeah, she would. She uh, he 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 taught me how to program. I I remember the first command I learned. I called my dad at work and I wanted to play a game. It was probably on a Spectrum, something like Manic Miner or something like that. And um, I said, Dad, how do I load this? And he said, Press the J key, which made it say load, and then two double quotes, and off you go. And that was it. That was the first command I ever learned. And, and mm-hmm. here we are. <laughs> my my dad was um, a CFO for an insurance broker. Okay. And, he, and he brought back home this Apple II. And yep. the minute he brought home the Apple II, and I swear the screen was like five-inch green screen, green and white. Yeah, yeah. And that kind of – the big joke used to be if he wasn't doing work, that game, that computer was Rob's because I fell in love with – so I would tell you he was probably the most influence for yeah. me that space and uh, yeah. and he let me go and then i had a couple of friends of mine that were 
older family friends that were into coding and they used to dump all those old nibble magazines on my desk and <laughs> you know, all of that. And, you know, the, the rest is kind of like history. And that's it. Yeah. I'm sad. I got rid of a lot of my old computers and I, I threw away just hundreds of computer discs with code that I'd written. And I, I wish I could look back and try it and see what I did with it all. But there was just one day, I think it was probably when I moved from the UK to the US, I'm just like, right, I'm getting rid of all this stuff yeah. and threw it away. And now I regret doing that. I wish I still had it. Been there. Hey, Mark, it's always a pleasure. Somebody needs a forms plugin, go buy WS Forms. It is, as Andrew Palmer says, it is the best forms product on the internet and the one I use. So go support Mark. And uh, if you need Mark or need I, Say hello, reminisce. It's always fun, right? Absolutely. Thanks, Mark. Have an awesome day, my friend. Thanks, Rob. This show is brought to you by StunningDigitalMarketing.com, your Toronto leader in digital marketing services. Not only do we protect your WordPress website, we can help you with your site, provide social media management for your business, or even do one-on-one -on -one consulting. To find out more, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.com. A very special thank you to my good friend Mark Westgard for joining me on this edition of the SDM Show. Hey, everybody, Rob here again. Thanks for listening to the SDM Show. It's such a pleasure to have you every week. If you want more on our agency website, go to stunningdigitalmarketing.com. We are your WordPress security experts. We'd be glad to help you out. If you want to learn more about me, Rob Cairns, go to meetrobcairns.online. From there, you can find links to everything I do on the web, as well as book time with me. So feel free. If you want to make comments about this podcast or know a guest possibly suitable for the podcast, please email us at podcast at stunningdigitalmarketing.com. Or conversely, you can go to X, formerly known as Twitter, and tweet at me at Rob Cairns. This podcast is dedicated to my late father, Bruce Cairns. Dad, I miss you very much, and I love you. Please join us next week for another interesting podcast and have a great week, everybody. Bye for now.